Welcome to another edition of Why Come Japan. I'm your host, Mr. Radbury, where I interview creatives inside or outside of Japan about their craft and how it relates to Japan. And today on my show is, uh, how would you like to introduce yourself as, like to newcomers on the internet? Because I know you've like you started once with the the channel Book of Host, and now you're kind of it seems like you're trying to reinvent yourself again. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like I. <laughs> I, I like what I do. I, I build apps and stuff, um, and uh, I do a lot of consulting. So, um, like the whole creator thing hasn't been my full time job. Um, but uh, yeah, to like quickly introduce myself. Um, so I, I created a YouTube channel called Book of Host. Um, I had met uh, like Rachel and June and Victor and a lot of those guys um, at YouTube parties because I used to work at Google and um, uh, we were drinking and. They learned about my story, and so, so basically, yeah, I created a YouTube channel and did some interviews with some some of the vloggers out there, and uh, then I started making some videos. But um, like I said, I mean, it wasn't. I have a full time job, and um, I wasn't super into it. However, now recently, um, I've been reading a few like memoirs and stuff, and also some Amazon singles, and I've been thinking of releasing kind of my story that I had written a lot about. Um, uh, over a series of like five or six books. Um, and so, really? yeah, so I think I'll, I'll probably shift more away from YouTube and, and more to kind of email delivery of some of the short stories um, until the, the release of each section of the series of books. But yeah, that's kind of what I've been working on recently. Email delivery. Okay, so kind of like, uh, like, because I know people do newsletters through email, Um so and that and that eventually like would lead to like a full book or just um just like cut up in little pieces yeah definitely so so i've uh, i've actually worked with a few best selling authors so far um i i worked with one person that writes like business leader non fiction books um and I had her craft up like some chapter summaries for me, and we worked on it for a bit um and then I, I read some chapters based on that that prep work she helped me with, and then um, recently I, I met uh, a New York Times bestselling author for both nonfiction and fiction, and she has a few Netflix deals, and um, she really likes my stories and and was suggesting we do a um, a co-writing kind of thing, um, but you know there's I, I still need to write a lot more of the experiences, and so what I was thinking of doing is um, publishing a lot of those stories over email and on, on my blog and uh, basically over time assemble a lot of those stories into a series of like five or six 60 page books um, and release them like that. Right, well you, so when you, you said that you worked at, when you worked at Google that you met like a lot of the creators like Gimme Breakman and Rachel and June, were, mm -hmm. did they talk to you and say, hey, you got a great story, you know, this is something you need to put on YouTube? Because you've made like, what, uh, three videos I guess of it? Or like one where you actually went to Osaka and you showed us where you actually became a, a host or a person who hosts clubs. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you've like had to define this five or six times. Do you ever get tired of having to explain what it is? Yeah, I mean, I mean, most people. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I, I kind of told them I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of doing something to share my story. Um, I'm not sure if YouTube is the right place. I, I really want to write a book. Um, and release some of the stuff I wrote. Um, and actually I had told them, I think, um, so originally when I was a host, I was writing all my learnings as like a pickup book, but then okay. I, I, I kind of matured a bit and I realized I didn't want to sound like a total piece of shit. And um, so I, I decided to kind of pivot that. And that's, that's when I saw Book of Mormon, the musical in New York. And so like I saw the musical, then immediately next day I saw it again because it was so good. And I had the idea to kind of just share my journey, um, like the musical kind of. And uh, so when I would like told people this kind of this change, very dramatic shift from one end of the spectrum to the other of going from Mormon to uh, be becoming a host, um, like at the YouTube parties and in other places, people always kind of freak out. And it was something that I wasn't not necessarily proud of, like, like, I think you probably know that hosts aren't really something to be proud of or, or working in the music show by industry here. And so yeah, I, I, that, I hid that's it for true. most, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I hid that fact. And, and then when I started just like sharing my stories, 
while drinking with people and just hanging out, everyone would always tell me to write a book. And uh, Rachel and June and Victor and a few others, they, they want to do the interview, of course, on YouTube. So um, it just kind of came out and um, I've just been doing it in my spare time. Oh, okay. I'm guessing that uh, probably around the time when you were thinking about writing this book uh, initially, I think this was back, uh, what was it, 2016? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, this was like around the time when like Julian Blanc was in the news. Is that yeah. right? <laughs> so I think probably it was probably not a good time to make a pickup artist book um, since that scene, yeah, I guess, that, is kind of tainted. Was... <laughs> yeah. I guess you would say at this point. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I also, you know, like I'm married and have a kid and it's and it's it's not something I want to be known for. Right. Yeah. And sure. Like when you're single. Yeah. You pick up girls or you go out. Um, I guess like nowadays people have Tinder. So much of the magic is probably lost. But like, you know, it's, it's just a phase. It's not like something that you should take so seriously. And um, like like Julian Blanc, for example. Um, so, yeah, it was just. I was never truly committed to it, but I thought it was like, oh, something I can make money off. But, um, but you know, I just have had such a focus on my career and I've done rather well with it. So it was just, always just kind of a distraction for me. Um, but now it's more of, uh, you know, everyone likes the story, right? And instead of just being a pickup book, um, they, uh, I think it's just kind of generally interesting to people. And so that's why I think uh, I just want to at least get the story out there in text format, um, even if I don't make YouTube videos. So you came to Japan initially as a missionary. Um, did yeah. you have any interest in Japan prior to coming to this country? Yeah, I mean, you know, probably the same as everyone else. Um, you know, I had seen a few anime series like, I mean, I, I don't really like anime. Um, <laughs> it seems like everybody who I interview on the show tells me they don't like anime. So, <laughs> but like the, my my first exposure to the art form was this series called Golden Boy. It was like a six part anime series, one season. Oh, okay. Um, it was like borderline kind of like perverted. Yeah, that's. Content. I was gonna say it's not semi pornographic almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's it's definitely on that line, right? And it was just so out there that it was just like, oh, Japan's weird, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I never wanted to live here or, or come here. And uh, then in, in college, um, it was like, oh, study language. And I was like, well, I'm terrible at the romance languages. Um, and I was like, I'll try Japanese because it was offered. And but I took one 101 course and uh, right before my mission. And I got like, I barely passed. Like I only, I only got a D plus or whatever it was because I knew the professor. So, huh. so like I, I didn't have real interest and I thought the language was terrible. And, and I was like, oh, it's, you know, sushi and anime, right? So I didn't right. really have an interest. Okay, so you did have some inter prior interest in Japan because I know like when you're a Mormon missionary, you don't get really to choose where you want to go. It's just like yeah, I mean, you're going like, to guess... Uganda or something, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had, I had like interest, but it was about on the same level as any other interests in my life. It wasn't like I have to go to Japan. Um, and then, you know, when you apply to become a missionary in the Mormon church, they ask you to list all your foreign language courses. And so I, I listed the other languages as well. Um, and that's when like, I guess they were like, Oh, well, any exposure to Japanese will be helpful. And they, they, they sent me there, I suppose. Uh, well, I mean, according to the church, it's through revelation from God, they choose where I go, so. Um, <laughs> a lot of things are chosen through revelation of God through the Mormon church. Um, because uh, uh, I guess if no, anybody who's just listening to this podcast for the first time or who doesn't listen to this channel, I'm actually, I, I guess I'm still a Mormon. I've just, just been incredibly inactive. Um, I, there's a story here, but um, I guess we'll get to that in a moment. But yeah, you, there's a lot of things in the church that are, you know, they're just kind of just made up, I guess you could say. Uh, I don't really know the explanation for it unless you know something more than I do. Um, I mean, really, the best explanation is the South Park episode. <laughs> which one is that? I mean, there's there's a bunch of them, right? Or there's a there's I mean, only one. I mean, the, the interesting thing is 
the the origin of the Book of Mormon, the story has changed multiple times in the history has it? of the church. It's okay, because the, the one I know is it's like it, Moroni went to New York and then he found the tablets in some underground somewhere because God told him that's where it was. And then he put on magic glasses and then he translated it for reasons. Yeah, I guess there was a story before that at some point. And so okay. like, like much of of religion and whatnot, it gets revised so often for convenience. Um, and like even now, uh, it, it's my, my family's still Mormon. Um, and they'll, they'll tell me about changes like, oh, it's now okay to drink coffee. And uh, <laughs> so it's like, oh, wow. Guess you're wait, 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 what? I, this I didn't know. It's okay to drink more coffee now in the Mormon church? Is that true? Yeah, they're revising a ton of stuff. They cut down the meeting length, I guess. And now coffee and tea and stuff is okay to drink. And they they even change a lot about the, the way missionaries go about their work. Um, they, they removed like one of these freaky rituals in the temple that was like one of my first signs. I was like, I got to get out. Like, this is a cult. Like, something's wrong here. Um, Which one was that? So, yeah, so... <laughs> This is uh this is this is kind of funny. So I, I guess you know if anyone listening is like, if you are a big Christian or believe God and stuff, I mean more power to you. I think any framework that kind of gets you through life, which kind of sucks, <laughs> um, why not? Um, religions won those those paths, but for me, yeah, I just I can't buy it. It's I would rather not take in all the lore, right? <laughs> um, I would just rather just yeah understand that you know work hard stay healthy don't be a douchebag that's like my guiding framework right but anyway so like you go to the temple and you have to like be worthy to go to the temple right and, you have to uh, get like what they call a temple recommend right is that the wording they use it's a, it's an id card for the for this castle oh it's an if id ever, like, card okay this i didn't know okay it's an id and it's signed by your local church leader and so it's like um if you've ever seen a castle in your city um, and it has like a golden dude with a trumpet, this is the temple that I'm talking Moroni, about. Moroni, right? <laughs> yeah, um, Moroni. And so you get this ID to join, to go into the building, right? And so once you get in there for your first time, you do all the rituals for yourself. And every time after that, you're doing the rituals proxy for a dead person. This is a TLR oh. of the Mormon temples, basically. Right, right. Well, I, I did uh, that. You do like baptisms for the dead, right? So that's one of them. That's just one of them. But when you oh, that's just one of them. To, okay. Yeah, that's the one that you don't need the temple recommend per se. Like, um, once you become like an official adult, or you go on a mission, or you get married, um, you there's all these other rituals available, and the one that is the first thing that you do when you enter, it's called the washing and the anointing. And, okay. And um, this is something where basically you walk in, you strip down under a sheet, like like you're a ghost for Halloween kind of thing. They, it has a hole in it and your head's through it. And there's a sheet and you strip down, buck naked. There's like three or four old dudes there. And like my dad was there. And uh, they, they'd say like this anointing, this kind of blessing. And then they take oil and, or no, they don't take oil. They take uh, first water. There's like this little fountain like poking up from the side in this room and they take it and they like wash different parts of your body with this anointing ritual. Um, and including they, they stick their hand on their sheet and like they grab your, like they, they tap, well, they, don't grab. <laughs> they like tap your chest and then your hip and your knee and your belly. Right. And you're like buck naked in front of these random strangers. <laughs> and this so sounds like, like borderline then, pedophilia, like, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like this thing, when this happened, like I was freaking out. I was like, so what is this? And that's the point where I was like, I got to get the hell out of this church. <laughs> Wait, how old are you? You said 14, right? That I had done. But the problem here is when you become a missionary and you decide and you get the place told to you that you're going to go to, there's no turning back like from the social element. Like that's right. the only way you get into the temple is deciding to become a missionary. And so everyone already knew I was going to Japan and, it was like, I could not turn around at this point. And so I'm just trying to like think through what's going on. I'm buck naked in this room, right? And then they have you step into these pajamas, uh, which is this other kind of weird thing. It's like your first magic underwear, basically. Right. Um, and then I, I kind of like blocked out some of it because I was just like so freaked out. And so um, 
a lot of these rituals are online if you want to read more about it. I've actually never heard of this ritual. Okay. Times. Huh. Yeah. So they revised that, and that was an after a revision, if you can believe it. Um, and then in 2007 or so, which is well after I did it, um, they revised it again, apparently, because like people are complaining that this is weird as shit, right? And, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, can I cuss on Twitch? I yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. Just just don't <laughs> say uh, anti anything that's uh, transphobic or homophobic, and you're probably okay. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, so... So yeah, it was uh, it was it was pretty wild, um, and so that that was probably like the turning point for me, and that's like kind of where it starts the mission. But yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. So how old are you? You were fourteen. No, I was uh, I was nineteen. Because oh, nineteen. You, that's like right before you, you go on a mission. On your mission. So. That's right. Yeah, because you always go very young, like when you're like in the early stages of your twenties. Yeah. Huh. All right. And they have to do this for most missionaries? Because like, I never went on the mission. Uh, my, I was luckily, my mother decided that she didn't want to let me go on a mission. Yeah, so basically as a requirement before you become a missionary, you you have to go to the temple. It's like a, it's like a prerequisite. Right, I, I ex kind of expected that much. Yeah, yeah, so like all missionaries do this. Um, it's, it's just a thing. And then, but if you don't go, then they don't let you go until like into your like some, some 20s age. They might have changed it by now, but um, or when you get married, and uh, at that point, then you go through your first time before the marriage and all that. Wow. Okay. Um, I did not know about this one. I mean, because I've learned all these like kind of crazy things. Um, I'll get into it in a minute. But about one of the things that made me take a step back from the church. That's like saying this. This is a little strange. Um, it was in the baptism, I guess. Uh, well, I guess I'll just talk about it now. Um, the thing that made me kind of step back from it was just like learning these little bits of tidbits about the church, like the lore, quote unquote, like about how when you die, you don't you go to the heaven, but you go to a planet called Kolob. And then uh, what are some of the other things? The thing that really kind of what's that? Yeah, that's a good one. That's that's some really great Mormon lore. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other one was like uh, the pre-existence. That one was oh, a little pre strange. Pre-existence, you're bringing it back for me. I'm getting all nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> God. I mean, I think uh, I think it was an interview with Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who aren't Mormon, um, who just had Mormon friends. Is that right? They don't. They're not actually Mormon. Is that correct? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The who? The Trey Parker, Matt uh, Stone, the South, South Park, Park guys. Traders, specifically. Yeah. So, like, I had heard a few different, like, myths and stuff or, like, like stories about them. And I guess, yeah, that's that's what it was, is they just grew up in, like, a Mormon area where they had a lot of Mormon friends or something like that. And, um, and they just thought they were interesting. Okay. Yeah, because I remember reading an interview with them, and they pretty much... They had a really good analogy for what the Mormon church is. It's kind of like, uh, so for example, the Bible is Star Wars. And then the sequel is, I guess, you know, the, new, the Old Testament is Star Wars. The New Testament is The Empire Strikes Back. And then the Book of Mormon's like Return of the Jedi. Um, yeah. And basically, like, the Mormon church was, or Je the Church of Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ, or however they want to be called, Latter-day Saints. So what, what's the title they go by now? Is there a new one? Uh, I don't know what it is now. I've like, it seems like they've rebranded. Um, but it's like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints when I was in the church. Right. Well, because I remember when I was there, they had to like change the the lettering because they had to like they just put Jesus Christ in big like bold letters and like have Latter-day Saints in tinier font underneath it. And they said that was like better with the getting more members for the church, supposedly. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, oh, okay. So yeah, basically, Trey Parker, Matt Stone were saying that Return of the Jedi was kind of like it's 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 a good example of like a group of uh, religious people who think that that part, this part of the Bible, is the best part, you know. And I mean, usually when you get to the third movie of any series, that's when they kind of start to run out of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and that's when like they start like making up new stuff. And I don't know if you're like familiar with the 
I'm not sure if you ever followed like Halloween or like Friday the 13th and like some of the like the later movies where they just get ridiculous where they have all these like ideas behind about why Jason Voorhees is evil or why Michael Myers is <laughs> evil like he's he used to be a part of a secret society or he's actually uh evil incarnate or or whatever uh, and so you like you learn about these things about the church like like I was just saying pre-existence and uh baptisms for the dead and I think the one that really kind of like blew my mind was the one where like you don't actually you have a different name when you go to heaven because you have like there's three kingdoms like there's celestial telestial and like like i can't remember the third one like outer darkness or something uh refresh my memory C correct me if i'm getting any of this wrong uh oh no no yeah you got it totally right it's like uh if you if you have a perfect knowledge of the truth and and you reject it then you go to outer darkness so that's probably where i'm going um okay but actually no you i can't go there it would have to be like a leader in the church basically but then there's the three levels there's no like specific heaven it's like telestial terrestrial and then celestial which is like the highest that's where you get like multiple wives and stuff and you can make your own planets and all that cool yeah cool um yeah so yeah the thing that kind of like the you know separated me from it was like why do i ha how did how do they know i have a different name on this planet and supposedly i what from what i learned was when you get this name it's told to you in the temple but you're not allowed to repeat this name to anyone i'm like how do they know i'm not going to repeat it <laughs> i mean you know about this right i mean i feel like i'm the only I, one who I, I knows about it I remember my name it's near you, and dear to my heart okay can you not can you not share it because of uh uh you have parents that are both in the more still in the mormon church i'm guessing Oh, I I would be happy to share it. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll do this. Okay, if you if you sign up to my newsletter, <laughs> the, <laughs> that's good. I like it. The first email everyone will get tomorrow <laughs> will be my secret Mormon name. <laughs> all right, all right. So well, I will tell you my secret Mormon name. But here's the funny thing about that name. You're bringing it all back, Bradley. This is great. Like I <laughs> I remember all this shit. I mean, I can't. I was thinking about it last night. <laughs> It's uh so so I mean the it's not a special name because everyone else in the temple that same day they get the same name. <laughs> what? Okay, this I didn't know. All right. So it's it's mass naming, like huh? Like I know like genocide is mass murder, right? So what do you right. call mass naming? Is there? Like, <laughs> it's not a laughing matter. But yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you're saying. Well, genocide isn't, but mass naming is really funny. <laughs> right. Huh. Well, all it's right. Like, I guess... uh, do you know that church in Korea um, where they do mass marriages? And it's like... Is it like the like, Mooney one or something? Yeah, there's like a thousand people, a thousand women on one side, a thousand men on the other side. And then there's like this dude, like the moon guy. Um, he's just like pointing at both of them. He's like, you, you. And they're like, they're married. Boom. And then he's just going down the aisles like mass marrying people it's like that but for right names. just with <laughs> names all right okay all right um can, can i ask you this much about the name is it like a name that's like sounds like something that would be biblical like that's a very biblical name yes it is okay it's a very all biblical right. name i'll give i'll give everyone a hint i'll give you a teaser it starts with an s Okay, because the way so, the way I pictured it, because you know, if we're going to a planet called Kolob when we die, I imagine it must be something that sounds very either Greek in origin or something very uh, archaic, like super archaic. Because <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, what is it? You learn about a lot of the weird names in the Book of Mormon, like uh, yeah. Nehor, I think is one of them. Do you remember any of these stories? Because I mean, you had to teach them when you were on a mission. Uh, no, there's anti Nehi Lee, and then there's Nehi, oh. and I think there's Nehor too, and there's also a moron. Nehor, really? There, there's yeah, there's a book of moron, and there's a book of <laughs> Nehor. Uh, I'm or maybe I'm getting that wrong. I I should just pull up my I, book of Mormon, check it out. It's been so I quit the church in 2004. Yeah. So I I haven't like touched any of it since then. 
Um, okay. Really, the, the one thing that refreshed my mind was the musical back when I saw it was 2013. Um, so, okay. Yeah, it's it's kind of all foreign to me now, which is a great feeling because I grew up with that stuff, right? <laughs> I'm finally, mm. like, done with it. It's, it's out of my mind. Yeah, I mean, there's all these weird names, so that's that's what I pictured my name would have been, but I guess I'll never learn what it is, and, and it's probably nothing, it's probably like something simple, like an, a Monty Python-esque name, like my name is Tim, or something. <laughs> that's what I picture it as. My, my secret Mormon name is Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. <laughs> <laughs> that's not it no so if, if you go to book bookofhost.com and sign up to my, new, my newsletter then i will send an email sunday tomorrow japan time with the yeah. secret mormon name and i'll just assume you came from this podcast all right okay that's a good stealth ad there i like that one <laughs> um well there's other stuff i was thinking about yesterday as well that was just very strange that made me take a step back like i guess then i'd also learn things about how the different groups of mormonism that exist because i mean you know probably when you were in school or you went you went you were in utah right so being a mormon uh, I in grew up utah in, I, I was in utah and idaho mostly yeah okay because a, a lot of the time if you had a picture of the temple or any association with the church the normal kind of like response is oh you mean the religion where everybody has a lot of wives like are you a polygamist or like is your dad a polygamist you know that that sort of thing and you're like no 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 it's not it's not polygamy and you have to like teach them about the more mainstream version of uh mormonism the one the one i went into and the one and i guess you're uh you were associated with not the one yeah where, there's like, so many yeah there are so many splintered off branches that when they they basically said okay you can't practice it on earth but when you die get all the wives you want um that's literally <laughs> what they said <laughs> and because they were being hunted down by the u.s army right and Wait, okay oh yeah yeah that's gets, right yeah gets shot in jail and so it was so bad they're like okay we give up no more polygamy right but they're like but when you die we get to do it and <laughs> so i think at that point the u.s army was like okay whatever you're not worth the bullets and they moved on but um but yeah there a lot of the groups that are like no that's like why i, I signed up to this and and those folks they like kept doing it and they like went to all sorts of out of the no out of nowhere like podunk areas in utah and wherever well, places like in texas practice. too right because I, I remember seeing in the news like they had a bunch of uh these these mormon mormon groups that were you know polygamy ones and mm -hmm. they would get discovered and they get busted pretty much yeah uh, by the the police. So wait a minute. Why was was the U.S. Army? It was trying to ban polygamy. Was that what it was? Well, I think it was. I mean, so this is all I know from like growing up in the church. Like, I, I don't really, I haven't fact fact checked everything. But basically, you know, it was a big, fast growing growing group of people, and that was seen as a threat to like most governments. Like, you know, what China does with groups of religion that grows really quickly <laughs> um, yeah and so they were like oh we got to get rid of these people and they're they have multiple wives and all this stuff and um but then like on the backside, you know the mormon church did some really bad stuff too which is recorded as fact in in history um and they were like recruiting like daughters of people that were like 14 and they're marrying them right and so they definitely had a lot of reasons um to be pissed at the mormons right uh like the u.s citizens and so they chased them out of, I think it was like Kirkland, Ohio, and okay. they drove them out. And that's why they went to Utah. Um, but in the process, they kept battling. And like on the way out, they would like fight. And I think there was like some truce at some point. And they're like, okay, you stay in Utah. Like No one wants to be here. <laughs> and, and then like they stopped. And they, they also agreed not to do polygamy. And they, they, of course, like killed the founder of the church. So, or, or like random people old founder of church while he was in jail um and so at that point it like really shifted into a business and um and that's where it like grew really quickly and they had all these industries in utah that funded the church so hmm 
Uh, yeah, because I remember they were like in he recorded history. They're like one of the first groups to actually pass the Rocky Mountains, because you had people like the Donner Party who ate themselves and uh, all those other great people who failed to cross the Rocky Mountains due to lack of resources. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was like the Oregon Trail, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just just like that, that video game. game. <laughs> all that dysentery. Um, isn't there? Well, yeah, there's like a book by John Krakauer. I can't remember which title, Into Thin Air or something. I can't remember which one it is, but it's about like the mass slaughter, so supposedly of by Mormons, by like Native Americans or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> help me fill in the blanks here if you know anything about this. Yeah, uh, I don't know. That might sound interesting. Um, I'm not like a, I'm not obsessed with the church history or anything, but. I had read some things online um, after quitting that were never, of course, told in the church, right? Like, apparently, like, some settlers were moving in, near their settlement, and they, like, did a deal with the Native Americans, and they, like, ambushed them and massacred these settlers, these, like, innocent people, right? And that's that was, like, swept under. Right. So. Uh, I guess I should probably begin with my story about my Mormonism story to give like greater context to this, because uh, m at this point in time of my like my life, my mom was kind of playing Russian roulette with uh, religions. I want to say, and I think the one where the bullet that finally killed was the Mormon Church, because uh, oh. she was getting a divorce from my father, and she was kind of looking for answers in her life. Um, and then she had, like, this one friend who was a, an evangelical, you know, like, the type that, like, the Jesus camp type, the ones that, like, sing and stand and they sing uh, songs like My Redeemer Lives or something 500 times or something in one evening. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think my mom got really tired of having to stand and sing all the time. <laughs> I think this is the main reason. And then she saw an advertisement for the mormon church on tv and of course that's what led to mormons coming into our house and you know um converting us and getting us to be baptized and all that jazz um and at the same time like my father was kind of out of the picture at this point but he tried very hard to like tell me like you you can't be a mormon like that's the religion you escape from you don't like it's like that one scientology or like jehovah's witness you don't go into this one and you know i'm like i'm young like what is that like 14 or something and it's like i don't understand what he's saying like i just thought he was just angry at my mom so i had no idea what was going on um eventually what led to my mother's separation from the church was a lot of it was due to um her having different values than like uh mormons because, you know, you could generally say that Mormons generally kind of have more conservative values than they do liberal ones. Because there's not much diversity in the church. I mean, uh, did was there anybody who was not uh, <laughs> a white person in your church? Did you have any, like, people who are of African or Latino descent or Asian descent, for that matter? They were pretty rare. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's... I guess it kind of depends where, because like where I grew up was like predominantly like middle class white people, right? Um, but maybe in an area where it's not so predominantly white, maybe there's more um, Asians, for example, maybe there's more Asian Mormon. But yeah, it is, I, I'm pretty sure it does probably suffer from diversity, at least in the US, right? Yeah, uh, it was something around that. And I think it was like right after 9 11 that you had. Bush, he was, um, he decided to go to the Middle East, you know, to what we thought was going to find Osama bin Laden. But then he kind of like spun the news or sp spun Congress or I don't know, I forgot what exactly happened. In 2003, he's like saying, no, no, we need to go to uh, Iraq because they got weapons of mass destruction. And uh, my mom at the time, she was saying stuff like, I don't think we should be going into Iraq. And the people of the church, they're very against her ideals. They're like, like no, they're terrorists. They need to be, you know, d 
defeated. They need to be gone. You know, we need to bomb the hell out of them. <laughs> that was basically their attitude. And she didn't like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you definitely get, I think it's skewed to Republican in, in the church in the U.S., for sure. Um, and so I think it's like a very kind of <laughs> us versus them mentality. Yes. Yeah, so that was, uh, and like they used to say things to my mother, like, I used to like you, and things like, <laughs> things like that. And so like, she would she do things like where, you know how like you're in the Mormon church, you're supposed to like pray to like open the ceremony and then close the ceremony. I remember my mom used yeah. to like go up and she used to like pray and like saying, I pray for the terrorists and that's <laughs> that sort of thing. Just to like kind of troll them a little bit. And I don't know exactly 100% what happened, but because we don't really talk about this. It's, uh, it's one of these things where it's like, uh, it's kind of, it makes us uncomfortable talking about the church. Uh, because my mom, she really later got remarried to someone who was in the church. And they don't go in at all anymore. Now they, my mom has now, she messaged me today. She actually just became a yoga teacher. So, um, but yeah, uh, that was part of the reason why I'm not with the church anymore. <laughs> That's that's my story. But anyway, the, this interview is not about me. It's about you. Uh, <laughs> I figured having this this context in mind would be helpful going into this interview. So, <laughs> yeah, Radley and I had had talked about the whole Mormon thing before, and so it was. Uh, it's always fun to talk to him about our past. L let me pivot here from this. I don't know how to transition out of this, but uh, so eventually <laughs> you went on your mission to Japan. Um, yeah. And I would like to argue that, well, I guess not 100%, but the Mormon lifestyle doesn't really mesh well with the Japanese culture. And the reason why I say this is because, uh, like, for number one, well, I guess now that you've told me that they've revised the caffeine rules, like, you can't really drink caffeine. Back when you were Mormon, you couldn't drink caffeine, you couldn't drink alcohol, you can't consume pornography, you can't masturbate, you can't. Uh, you, if you're, if you're, well, from what I understand from being a missionary is you can only listen to church music. And if you're lucky, maybe they'll let you watch R rated movies like Braveheart because it has good themes in it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why like the norm here, uh, breaks the, the code of the Mormon church, but you know, like there's so much revision going on and even now like missionaries play Magic the Gathering on their mission, whereas really? when I grew up and I was on the mission, that was considered satanic, you know. So right. I think that I think specific rules aside, um, you know, there's a lot about Japanese culture that is against uh Mormon rules, but I kind of the people I interacted with, um, they they were, they took it very seriously and I th I think Japanese people in general um, no matter what they do, they tend to really get into things, um, whether it's uh, like those like like 60s hairstyle guys that bebop dance in Harajuku or, or that, that one park, uh, Yoyogi Park, right? Um, stuff like that. Like Japanese people are very, um, very in intense about their passions and, and and hobbies and they they really go into it and so a lot of the the members of the church were like very into it very committed and um they just found ways to, to make it work um for their life so huh. um, however at the same time you know I, I did hear stories about people getting passed up for promotions because they couldn't take clients out to to drink and, and things like that so um so yeah it's it's one of those things where it's at odds with the norm here, but I mean, it's also fairly at, at odds with the norm in many places. And, um, and I think that the strength of Japanese people, which is being able to focus and being very consistent, um, that certainly, I think, helps them go, uh, kind of buck the trend here, right? Um, yeah. Um, well, because what I understand, basically the goal of any missionary when you're on your mission is you need to get as many <laughs> baptisms as possible, or at least that's kind of the overall goal. Would you agree with that? Um, that's the primary success metric, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, because I remember I, I was bored one time and I'm like, I want, I was wondering, how does Mormonism actually work in Japan? Have you done any research about like other people who've come to Japan, like as a Mormon? Coming to Japan as a missionary, certainly the low conversion rate was a, a common topic among missionaries. And so oftentimes people would just talk about getting at least one or two baptisms in two years. That would, that would be considered like a success. And so, um, so there's that element, but also, you know, there's always kind of like one or two Mormons that break into pop culture and, and drag a lot of people into the church, like, uh, Kent Derricott, he's kind of like a celebrity, um, or, uh, I forgot, I forgot who it was, but he's basically like a TV personality and he got famous because after his mission and he was here teaching and he, on a, on a game show that they put him on back in like the eighties, he did this thing with his glasses where he made his eyes look big, like moving it. And that like shot him to fame. And then suddenly Mormonism was kind of under the microscope in Japan. But I mean, not, not like it would get in America just because at the same time, you know, um, there's a, a stigma with religion in Japan from the terrorism that happened. Um, and so, so yeah, it's like, it's one of those things where there's a decent amount of uh, awareness but still there's a lot of forces at play that act against it and so baptisms were super hard for for people like historically speaking right well because I, I remember reading somewhere that uh there was like a high number of baptisms in japan like a huge huge number um mostly because like some i think some stake leaders or something figured out a way on how to get japanese people to to do the baptism but they would be incredibly inactive they would figure out a way because like the, the way they figured it out was japanese people aren't going to say no to your face so they would figure out a way to like get them to go to the church and get baptized like one day i don't know if you've heard about any of this yeah i mean so so there's a bit of that to it um but what I usually experienced was people would just kind of not show up or not do the thing, or they would get other people to intervene. Like, um, Soka Gakkai is a, a really common, uh, sect of Buddhism. That's basically the more, it's like Mormons of the Buddhism world. And really? yeah, they're, they're super, super strong. They have political influence, much like Mormons do in America. And, um, so we were teaching a kid, he was like, it's a high school age kid uh, about the church. And uh, when we went over there one day, there were like 10 people that basically said that they didn't ever want us to contact their, their son. Holy and shit. they were talking again. It was, it was like the Yakuza yeah. pretty much. Um, I've, I've seen similar cases like that in Kabukicho. And, and so, yeah, it was exactly like that. Um, so yeah, they, like in my experience, it was more of a, um, they they try to go through a third party to kind of like dissuade you and be like oh well they they said i can't so i can't because like they aren't direct, direct like you said um but yeah the, the like this the secret to getting a lot of people to just say yes um they didn't really every area within japan's different it's run by a different leader and so maybe one area's leader did that but our area leader was like focused on active members and so um we were not encouraged to do stuff like that. Huh. Yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. Um, it was, so wait, missions generally go for like around two years. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you you did your mission for, was did you do the full two years? Uh, I cut mine short by about seven months. Uh, okay. Um, so let me ask you this. At what point did you realize I don't want to be a part of this church anymore and I want to end this mission. Like what made, what made you make that decision? Well, you know, like that, that weird temple ritual where I stripped down buck naked, that, that definitely contributed that kind of seeded doubt in my mind. Um, I was never like super, super duper strong. Um, I, I just like grew up in it. Right. So I, and my brother went on a mission, so I decided to follow him. But um, I was also like, I was, ever since I was young, I was pretty emotionally detached. Um, like, like I've taken tests and stuff and some would say like, I have Asperger's almost cause I am so like, um, unemotional. Okay. <laughs> so like when you, when you're in a church and like people get up and cry about how they believe in Jesus and stuff, 
um, or how the, the church saved their life, um, or they're just crying all the time about things and, and hugging each other. I, that just didn't touch me. <laughs> like, I was just like, right. it's not logical. This church lore doesn't make sense to me, but you know, it might be a good thing, right? If it's a framework, then maybe I'll just follow along. So like I had all these doubts and it never really like hit me like it did most people in the church. Um, but then on my mission, um, uh, I, w- I would teach people and like, like the high school student case where like his family was very, very upset or other cases where like this, this lady who worked at the concession stand on the train platforms, um, you know, you have to pay 10% of all your income each month to the church. And, and I knew she didn't have a lot and she wanted to make big deposits to the church as like the tithing, also, right? That's uh, what they called it. Tithing. Yeah. There's tithing. And then there's fast offerings. And Oh yeah, that's I was, right. I was converting these people who would give up money and make these large decisions about their life like not working on Sunday and it was hard for her to change her schedule. Um, and uh, I just felt bad about it because I, I didn't believe the lore. I just thought it was like a decent framework for life, right? And um, so, yeah, that was all, all those cases kind of like combined. And I was just like, I, it was just really hard for me to kind of go about telling these stories about Joseph Smith, seeing Jesus and God in front of him and, and, translating these golden plates he found in his backyard in upstate new york (laughs) yeah uh, trying to like being able to sell this philosophy to people must have been very hard okay so i i don't know if you want to share the story or i don't i'm not sure how much information you want to divulge here but when you were a mission can i say where you were because i remember you telling me where you were set for your mission yeah sure you were in fukuoka right yeah and okinawa Right. Oh, and Okinawa. Okay, that I didn't know. I see. Um, I remember you telling me some story. I remember I meeting you on the Madunochi line because we used to work together. Or I worked as an intern at Japanese Pod 101. Maybe you remember that those days. Yeah. Uh, and I remember you, you asking you some questions about being a, a missionary here. And you said something about having to take care of drug addicts or something in Fukuoka. I don't know if you want to go into the details about this, but <laughs> that's up to you. Yeah, so so one of the so this is also kind of rooted in the reason why I, I wanted to stop the mission, um, also leave the church is, you know, they, they give you sales training in the mission training center in Utah, and uh, you learn all about sales concepts. They have you read sales books like Dale Carnegie books, um, uh, Stephen Covey books, um, and uh, they basically train you to be a salesperson. And within those materials, they say, they call it people open to the spirit, or open to the message, open to the gospel. And they list types of people that are open to the gospel. And um, those people are essentially people that have shit going wrong in their life. <laughs> huh. um, people with addiction, they call it. Uh, right. People who have recently lost family members, people... Um, uh, having like that are out of work. And so all these people, it, it, what it is, is it's, it's kind of like a predatory approach to sales, right? Um, playing on their emotions. And so based on these different situations, then they teach you uh, these pitches, these leads, how to like get their interest. Like if someone's lost a child, you would say, oh, are you interested in um, eternal families? And you, you, you start with those lessons once you get them to like talk to you, right? And so it's fairly predatory and... Um, it's kind of sleazy, and uh, and so yeah, that's um, that's one of those things that also contributed to me leaving. Um, and so yeah, I, I met a guy who clearly was tripping balls in his apartment and and uh, in Kyushu, and we were like, this guy is out of it. Saw his pupils dilate and stuff, and so we we're just like, we just kind of left there. Um, in another case, there was like some an old couple. And they were trying to feed us these egg sandwiches that were expired for two weeks. And they were super poor in Okinawa. Oh. And they were just lonely. And I was like, oh, this is sick. And so we just like kind of peaced out. But um, but yeah, there were a lot of those cases. Because the people that are open to like talking to a foreigner about religion, like they're not right in the head a lot of the time. Right. <laughs> like, right. Japanese right. people don't want to do that. Well, um, isn't that like with a cult, like they usually try to find broken people? 
I mean, yeah, uh, I've heard that from some cults. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's that that's kind of what happens is you end up talking to people with drug problems and, you know, you're told that they need it. It's like you can help them with a drug problem. Right. So you have to like go over to their house and you're like, this is kind of weird. And, you know, I living in Japan now, like you, you want to avoid all appearance of evil, right? As a foreigner. Right. And so thinking back to that, that's probably, probably the worst thing. Cause if like, you're in this apartment with this guy, police are immediately going to get assumed that you're doing it too. Right. Or you sold them. <laughs> the drug. Yeah. So, like, Jesus. Yeah. That's the worst bad. thing for me to do. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of weird. Um, it's one of those things, uh, that I, I just, I didn't like about it. That must have been very hard to handle, especially at the age of 20. I mean, taking all that in, um, not really knowing how to react to it. Uh, yeah, man, it was, uh, I mean, the, the good thing about the entire experience, um, and also like my experience coming to Tokyo and in Japan was, I mean, the mission specifically was kind of like trial by fire, fire in terms of becoming a man. Like you have to right. take care of yourself. You have to get yourself out of these situations and you have to learn how to read between the lines and all that stuff. So, um, you know, like the religion stuff aside, it's, I think it's a really great experience to mature. Um, and I definitely learned a lot from it. Right. Okay. So you actually got, you did what I didn't do you got excommunicated from the church or you not, not like you okay i should rephrase that you actually physically went there to be excommunicated not like they they picked you out of a crowd and excommunicated you well right so there's two things there which is you can remove yourself and then the other path is getting removed um so what i did was i voluntarily said i delete my records basically um well well, I mean, there's actually like a whole backstory of this. It's kind of long and complex, but basically I, I quit the church and I made them made them understand um, through a variety of ways that I was never interested in it again. And uh, so I left um, and my records were deleted because I requested it eventually. It, it took some years to get that to happen. But um, whereas excommunication is like someone commits a crime that's rather terrible or they do something, the church doesn't want to be associated with that person for probably PR purposes, they remove them. And then they're like, we don't think it's easy for you to get back on the, the good train. And so then you have to go through a really long process to get back in. Yeah, um, well, cause I, I, I don't know too much about it. Cause uh, like, as you know, the, the Mormon mafia, I guess you should call them. They, uh, they try to find their very inactive members to make them more, quote-unquote, active. Um, yeah, definitely. Okay, so eventually it was just kind of a, for, I guess for probably a lot of people who probably leave the church, it's just kind of an accumulation of all this crap, um, the lore, the... I mean, which basically, I remember I, when I try to explain this to people, everybody always tells me it sounds like bad fan fiction of jesus bad jesus fan fiction um <laughs> that's great i like that uh a lot of yeah for a lot of people it's like an accumulation of a lot of things that happen to them inside the church which makes them leave uh but for you when you when you left you had your records re uh erased when you were when you went back to utah or when you were in japan when I was in Japan, um, really, it was, uh, yeah, I promised, uh, my dad that I wouldn't do it while still being registered to the same church as my family because like gossip and all that stuff. And so I waited till I, I moved to Japan. Um, I had actually like already moved out of the house well before then, but, um, after I came to Japan and, um, and, uh, it's actually a really interesting story. <laughs> like the details, it's just really long and, uh, complex, but uh, <laughs> sign up for his newsletter now. I should just spam that in the chat right now. <laughs> I mean, it, it was it's pretty full circle because yeah. I knew the person who deleted it for me, and oh, okay. the way I knew them was fairly fairly full circle. Um, so yeah, if you want if you want to hear that, it's just it's a really long story. Unfortunately. Huh? Like even the whole bit about promising not to delete my records, like while 
in the same state as my family, right? So right. it was just a long process. And like, I made a few concessions just to keep peace. And, um, and it, in, in the end, you know, it doesn't really matter when I delete it, just so long as I delete it. So, um, but it got, it got done. Um, it got done. Huh. All right. Uh, so wait a minute. Um, so when you, were your parents supportive of you when you made this decision or not at all? Oh, no, not at all. No, my family was supportive of me. Okay. Um, they don't, but they still, they still like you. They don't disown you, right? Yeah, I mean, it was, it's, you know, it's always like a, a pendulum, right? Um, at one point in time, especially right around that experience, pendulum had swung very far to one side of, of uh, everything focused around my decision, right? And now, you know, because <laughs> essentially I moved to Japan and I, I stopped talking to them and they like called the embassy on me and stuff <laughs> to find me. Um, Whoa, I was just okay. like, oh, well, hey, you know, you knew the terms. <laughs> you broke the terms and uh that's why you haven't heard about my existence and so they they learned their lesson and they learned the bounds and where the lines were and so then you know now we have a fairly uh cordial relationship between huh. us. <laughs> well that's interesting um okay so basically from what i understand from your timeline uh you did an interview with rachel from rachel and june the youtube channel uh, huge creator <laughs> on this space. I can't believe I'm saying this. Or not this space, on the YouTube space, I guess. She's not a Twitcher. Um, it yeah. It doesn't Twitch. <laughs> you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't have a good connotation. When you say YouTuber, it sounds better. When you say Twitcher, yeah, it's, it's like... Twitcher. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she only Twitches in private. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um... So when you left the church, you eventually went back to the States and then you came back to Japan um, for college. Is that right? Is that correct? Yeah, I, uh, I came back on just like a study abroad program. I had a few scholarships with colleges here. And so I was like, oh, why not? You know, I always wanted to kind of experience Japan as not a Mormon. Right. <laughs> right. It's a lot more fun. <laughs> Right, and in this interview, I, I watched the, I watched the extended one, which I think is the much better one. Uh, I always like long form interviews. I pre I pre always prefer the podcasts where they humanize people. But yeah, in that interview, what, what I'm trying to say here is, in that interview, you were talking to Rachel, and you're saying that at that time you joined a bunch of clubs at your college, and one of them was like a party club or like an asobi sakuru, is what it was called. Yeah. Right. And. Yeah. And it was at this gr this party where somebody mentioned, hey, you should just uh, become a host here in Japan. Now, now, let me ask you something. Was that said in jest or was that completely like Majime? Was that 100% serious? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I was trying to get a job that wasn't English teaching because I, I wanted, I, I didn't plan on staying here. I wanted to, uh, I was going to go back to the States and then apply for med school um, and and so I was like, oh, I, I have like one year to get really good at Japanese. And so I tried to apply, I tried to work at a ramen shop, izakaya, lots of different like interesting gigs. And uh, I was getting turned down. And so that's when some friends that in these circles, they were like, oh, you should be a host. Um, and it, it was, <laughs> I mean, so I, I had mentioned it was a cool thing before to them because I watched the great happiness space before I, I went back to Japan. And I'd also joked with people, I was like, I'm going to be a host when I go there and um, I'm going to experience this. Because um, again, like I, my, my first, some of my first exposure to Japan was Golden Boy and he just travels around Japan doing all these different jobs, like supposedly saving Japan, right? And so likewise- oh, I've never read it, like, so I couldn't tell you. All right. You know, it, it's, it's, it's entertaining as someone who doesn't like anime. So, okay. Okay. Um, and uh, so I was like, I'm going to do this. And everyone's like, ah, oh, you're full of shit. Or, you know, they would just like call my bluff. And so I, I had suggested it to my Japanese friends. And they're like, oh, yeah. And they, they're like, oh, it's a bad world. Or, uh, but yeah, maybe you could do it. You could probably do well because you speak Japanese well. And that was a point when they, they did suggest like, well, you could always be a host. And because they knew kind of my interest in it. Um, and that's that kind of sparked my my first experience. Okay, so it's kind of like learning about the culture before actually being interested in it. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, at this party club, did any of them have, like, the wild hair that you see in a lot of these hosts? Yeah, I mean, my friends were all Gyaru, right? Um, yeah, I, back when that was, was a Osaka. thing. Or is it, is it still a thing? Do people still do that? No, no, I mean, I think, you know, I think with the proliferation of a lot of Western, like, media and apps, like, the iPhone really brought the world together for Japan, because before, you had these feature phones and, of course, Japanese TV, which is insular, and... You know, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or YouTube, people are now picking up on foreign trends a lot faster. And so, like, that typical hair, well, a lot of people do it. I think it's still, you know, fades and stuff like that are more of a, a stronger trend in Japan, whether it's fashion or whatever it might be. So, I, I think Japan's changed a lot more rapidly in terms of, like, the... Well, thanks the to S&S. Culture. Yeah, huh. and, and fashion and style. Um, but back then, it was still very, like, insular and gyaru or a thing. Right. I mean, there's still, there's, you can still go to host clubs today, and they still have, they maintain that same look, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, um, when, when you talk to the primary clientele, um, their audience, right, they're not interested in that. It's kind of like, um, I mean, this is also very anecdotal. It's just... Um, some of the guys that I knew that worked there, um, like a few years later, they said, you know, it's it's not good business anymore. And now like shop bars are common. And so a lot huh. of those dudes opened up shop bars and um, it's more of a mainstream, lower price and kind of hipper uh, culture. I see. Uh, I mean, the image of hosts in Japan has a very sleazy association. Was this yeah. part of what got you interested in it i mean you knew about all this stuff before going into the business right i mean i had watched the documentary um i didn't know the full extent of the underworld uh, at that time but um you know it, i mean i i don't know what you call sleazy I, if if you're like, sorted i don't know what's what's a more appropriate title i mean i because i you, you know like what you were saying earlier is just that it doesn't have the best image out there yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, you have very limited exposure to non-religious Japanese culture. And then you, um, and you watch like the great happiness space and you're, you're like a single young male um, that just wants to get laid, right? Uh, right. In college. And so getting the thought of getting paid to drink with what appeared on the documentary were like decent looking gals right that was at the time that was what interested me right and uh huh. i wanted to make money as well and i wanted to experience the culture like something that i could speak japanese quite a bit and so the 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 thought of getting to speak japanese for eight hours straight there was no other part-time gig that would allow that and so um all that stuff just was like you know a bunch of check boxes for me and um so like you know i think sleazy is like one way to like kind of approach it definitely like looking back on it now but at the time i was just like oh it's just this kind of weird japanese culture um and you get paid to drink with girls that work in the red light business right and it's like right right um that's true oh because what during anybody's mission and probably a lot of people know this already or maybe they don't i'll just set it up anyway normally uh, there's a lot of missionaries that you'll meet who went on missions who've gone overseas and they speak languages really well and you got your your japanese up to like basically a native level just because of the dedication you had to put into just talking to people <laughs> and having to explain what the book of mormon is right yeah yeah definitely uh, like it definitely it's trial by fire like i said for a lot of reasons um just becoming like an adult and, and then there's the part of learning japanese and then you know like for my case where i I didn't really like the church. I, um, I, I took every opportunity to study Japanese because you can't watch TV, you can't do anything else, right? So yeah. it became a really intense focus for me. And then even after when I went back to the States, I tried to find ways to keep it up just because I thought it could be profitable, like working abroad uh, from that perspective and a differentiator um, when I wanted to look for work after college. And so I would, I would help fan sub anime and, and translate just to like keep it up right so yeah definitely right. but the the mission definitely like jump started me to speaking really well right um we have a question in the chat uh i'm not sure how to pronounce his name um 
I know he's on my YouTube page. So I'll just use his YouTube name. This guy named Vids of Your Mom, he asks, did you ever get expensive gifts? And if so, what were they? Because I know, like, uh, as, a, as a host, you sometimes yeah. the, the clientele, like, if they really like you, they'll bring, like, gifts and, like, little tiny things to, like, for you to enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I got lots of stuff. Um, I never got, like, a Ferrari, like, some host. Or, like, <laughs> what? Any, People get Ferraris? Get Ferrari. so, like, I didn't make crazy money. Like, I mean, I, I think it was really amazing for a college student. But, I, I mean, I this isn't... <laughs> The reason I'm writing a book and stuff is not because I made a lot of money, right? Because you wouldn't, you wouldn't care about writing a book. But um, yeah, it was uh, it was mostly like Louis Vuitton goods or like designer pins, like Chanel pins and things like that. That's not bad. I'd often, yeah, I'd often ask for the same thing though. Like when they did ask me for like, a, do you want something? And if I was if, if I didn't have it on me, I would try to get a uh, an extra one and I would just pawn it off. At Don Quixote or somewhere, and then I would make like six hundred bucks off it. Um, huh. And then, but I would have the same thing, right? So then I would show up with the, the same item, and so that's basically kind of what other hosts do. They they taught me that trick. Um, and so I got a lot of like designer goods essentially. Huh. So is it kind of a myth that they make lots of money being hosts? I mean, it, I mean, it's kind of the distribution is like any other distribution of of wealth. Um, it's like the top one percent, right? Um, mm -hmm. and it's always kind of an outlier in the industry because most hosts don't don't make more than a full-time uh salary man so really okay yeah. it's but, only like uh, the top five that make decent huh that's interesting uh, or it's okay so let me ask you this um so you when you first started becoming a host you were in osaka and you're mostly osaka based because that we, that's where your college was nearby right at the time yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and eventually, you you moved to Tokyo. Did you continue the host life in Tokyo? I mean, not at first. I mean, I I didn't. I had I had gotten the experience under my belt, and I was, I didn't want to do it. I was working as a butler at the Butler Cafe. Oh, and, okay. Um, I was trying to make an honest living right. as a butler, and uh, but it wasn't enough money. And I uh, when I moved to Tokyo, I was actually homeless. I didn't have a place to stay and wow. it was during the recession. And of course my parents didn't support me in my decision to stay in Japan. So I got zero financial support for them. Um, I didn't make a lot of money as a host in Osaka cause I was, I was terrible at it there. Um, it was much harder there. And uh, so yeah, so I was, I was homeless. I was living in that cafes and um, basically out of need. And I was tired of sleeping in a net cafe and showering in it. I decided to go back to the hosting in Tokyo and I was a bit more motivated not having a place to stay. Um, and then also as a student, you know, you, you get your financial aid um, dispersed to you, right? Right. Um, and at the time, the recession, like the yen was like 80 yen for a dollar. So yeah, I remember that. It was like, I was coming up short on a lot of, on paying a lot of bills. So um, I, I basically found a recruiter for hosts and other night workers and he toured me around all these host clubs and I had shared photos from the previous club. And he was like, okay, I can definitely sell you. And, um, and so he, I got to try working as a host at different clubs. I made 5,000 yen for every trial day. Um, and then once I picked the club that I liked, then, um, I mostly focused on, um, like, you know, street pickups and stuff initially. And, and so that's kind of how I went back into it is because I was out of necessity. Um, I, I knew I, I couldn't get into apartment quickly enough. And so, so that's that was kind of like the logic behind it. Huh. Um, well, that's interesting. Uh, I didn't know that part about you. Um... Yeah. So, so Radley and I, we went to the same college. And I'm not sure if you ever <laughs> saw a suitcase in the locker room. That was my suitcase. <laughs> was it? Okay. No, I don't remember a suitcase in the locker room, but okay. I would like stash my, my thing because it was a big suitcase and like I couldn't put it in the net cafe. And, uh, and I had to work when I wasn't in there. And so I would stash it there. Then eventually I stashed it at, um, at the host club in the back room where people get ready and stuff. But, right, right. Um, John Mija in the chat is asking, did you have any moments of Gaijin smash as a, <laughs> uh, as a host here? 
Moments of Gaijin Smash. I mean, every day of my life is a Gaijin Smash. <laughs> that should be the not, title of your book. Being... Every moment of my life is a Gaijin Smash. <laughs> not being Japanese here is a Gaijin Smash. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, I could I agree speak, with that. I speak Japanese and they're like, so are you going to... <laughs> like, yeah, it's like, come on, like, Why really? Try hard here? <laughs> I know what you're saying, yeah. Uh, um... What is but, it? Vid? Yeah, continue. At the host club. Yeah, at the host club. Was it? Do you do any any moments of Gaijin Smash? So yeah, so so the host club I picked actually was um, it was one where uh, another Gaijin had worked at actually a, a fairly popular Gaijin host. He was known. He was really? famous on the Gaijin Pot forums way back. His name was James, and um, so I picked that one because I thought they were used to it. Was um, a white guy? Also, pardon? Was it a white guy? Yeah, yeah. He was like Australian. Oh, okay. And um, I, uh, so like, I, that's why I picked the, that one because I was like, well, if he was able to do it there, then I can do it there. And similar situation. Interesting. Um, like he had the, the work visa as, as well as I. And so I was like, okay, I, I'll do it. And so I, I joined that club and they were used to this guy doing like taking tea time all the time and like getting favors done in the bathroom. And so they like quickly told me the rules. They're like, Hey, you can't do this stuff. This one guy did that. I'm like, Oh, it's okay. Like, I'm here for money. I'm not, I'm not a D bag like him. And, and so, so like they were conditioned, but I, I still leveraged it where I could. And I, uh, you know, like in, when you introduce yourself, like I would grab this big empty bottle of champagne and I'd ride it like a horse to the table, like slap in the back of it. Cause it's called the Nebuchadnezzar. It's like 17 liters. And, okay. um, and so like no host would do that, but I would just like grab it off the shelf and I would like ride it like a horse to the table. And I'd be like, do you want to open my Dom Perry tonight or <laughs> say dumb stuff like that? <laughs> and, uh, and it was like, and then I'd be like, so how many will that be? Like two, three, how many times? <laughs> and so, and so, like, no host would do that. They would just more, you know, no, no Japanese host would do that. They'd, they'd have a much less, um, much less bravado in their approach to the table for the first time with these new customers to meet, right? Right. Where I would, uh, I would, <laughs> for my instead of my my business card, sometimes I bought a, a deck of Trump card, uh, you know, playing cards. Right. At the Don Quixote, but the mm -hmm. ones that had porn on them. <laughs> okay. So, I've never seen those before, but all right. I would, I would sign it with a sharpie in front of them, and they would, they would see like this giant dick or this nude woman on it, and they're like, "What is this guy doing?" <laughs> and and so like you know, <laughs> I wouldn't call that a guy just smash though. But yeah, I mean, if they're gonna pick you as uh, as their host, they have to have like some initial like interest in you, right? Right. And so like basically know your know your customer essentially, and I knew the girls that would be likely to pick me as as their dude. And so I just kind of played to that as well as I could. So I, I did a fair number of Gaijin smashes, but I was still very serious about the work. Unlike the Australian guy before me who they complained about. Huh. Um, yeah. So they let you in despite uh, being kind of tainted from this um, Australian guy. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I did, I did what's known as a uh, Taiken. It's called a, a work trial, and right. um, so you know they saw like how I worked and how I could talk them up, and um, apparently they said my Japanese was a lot better than his, so um, they had a little bit more confidence in me for that reason. Uh, really, um, Vidzi, your mom, and the chat's asking why was hosting in Osaka much harder. I think you mentioned that okay. earlier. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, it's totally different humor there. Um, it's like going to the south or, or some place that's like very kind of insular. Um, Tokyo, it's, it's all about like, you know, fake love story. It's like they're playing a, a mobile phone game, like a, one of those dating games, right? But mm -hmm. in Osaka, they just want to like have fun and you have to tell jokes and and uh, the type of guy that's a host in Osaka, they're very good with the vernacular, right? And the jokes and huh. all that stuff. And I couldn't compete, to be honest. So Yeah, that Tokyo, sounds tough. Yeah, so, so when I moved to Tokyo, I had a totally different type of game. And it was a lot easier. And 
um, a lot of interest in foreigners and instead of this like kind of one time oh yeah i drank with a foreigner and i'm gone sort of thing um you're less of a token in uh in tokyo versus osaka really w would you say were there any other uh, hosts that were of caucasian descent that you knew of in tokyo yeah so there's this one other guy who's he's a french model um he he was also at the butler cafe um same time frame as me uh or, or like we overlapped um he was like extremely good looking and uh and he had like the perfect toast hair he was really good at doing his hair um but, like most of it was extensions though it wasn't real but um he he said he wanted to be it and because i had told him of of my experience in osaka he was like okay i'm gonna try it and he like showed up and he said he got fired the same day because he couldn't <laughs> speak and like he was like oh okay. they wouldn't give me a break can you believe this and i was like let's you expect it to be easy <laughs> so hmm. Um, also vids and your mom in the chat is asking if you drank a lot. I think, yeah, I remember you from your Rachel and June episode that you did. You said that you drink so much that you would force yourself to throw up at the end of the day. Cause it was just, it was so much alcohol you had to consume every day. Yeah. I mean, so you basically force yourself to throw up, uh, at least once an hour, um, it's just it's the the thing everyone does it the, the host bathroom actually is is equipped with things like stacks of mouthwash like one one off use mouthwash and stacks of oshibori that you can like wipe the puke off of your face um things like air freshener like for your clothes so um i, I got used to it like um <laughs> it was funny even after i had quit like a few years i'd go out seriously partying with friends and uh be like be drinking a lot of shots or whatever at the club um, and i would just like i just go to the bathroom and just like force myself to throw up because i didn't want to hang over you know right <laughs> i right, come back right. like all chipper and everyone's like done and then yeah it was it was something that i i got used to rather quickly right um well it seems like the greatest benefit you acquired being a mormon missionary and being a host is that it kind of made you into a better salesman would you agree I mean life is just like one giant performance like yeah never, i agree with that you can never like let yourself down or like or let, let down your guard rather um whether it's like an interview or um doing a group project at school or or work right um where you're forced to like talk to people that you would never drink with <laughs> yeah so so like everything's a performance and you know it's a little bit more focused on that since it's essentially sales um as probably in, if anyone's listening has done sales work then they'd probably agree um so yeah i mean it was especially coming from some some kid who was like a software developer in high school and probably one of the most socially awkward people um those two experiences definitely like taught me a lot really would you recommend it to anyone else to take the same route that you took uh going <laughs> from <laughs> You, let me just ask you this would you recommend anybody to become a host <laughs> well i mean so that's the thing is like it's hard and like no it's not good anymore like the, okay. the worse the economy gets the worst it is the worst it gets for like money making and so then it's is not it? worth the risk and and the the work and uh so basically it's one of those things where at a point in time during the japanese economic boom it had some real like potential for like being a great way to make money or whatnot but as a foreigner for one it's much harder like i had to deal with stuff i didn't have to deal um that, that the japanese people would have to deal with um and then there's a fact that like you basically wake up hungover every day um it's and you have to stay up really late um i was, I was staying up till like 8 a.m drinking so it's not something I would recommend. I mean, but I, I also did the, the interview with the guy that wanted to move here to become one. And um, his, he was just like extremely charismatic and he, he was an MC and he had a, he did like street magic. And I was like, oh, okay, well, and he, he was so persistent. Um, I was like, okay, well, he has a shot. And I was like, this will be fun content. Um, and so that's why I talked to him and just gave him some, some pointers. But I think in, in that interview, I, I consistently said, um um you know don't don't do this this is this is kind of <laughs> dumb like you shouldn't do this for a long time um yeah have you touched base with him recently at all 
do you do you keep in contact with him yeah he's like an mc on um some like entertainment tonight shows and he does these random really? shows in the states he lives in in la um he, now he also has like a coaching business for public speaking and, and all that um i told him like we should do uh, an update bid and just like say say what he's up to now to promote his his coaching service um he, he basically told me like he he could never he couldn't get the job for example like huh. they wouldn't let him because he couldn't speak japanese oh right and what i suggested yeah. to him was basically he do like magic and stuff for host clubs or he creates some experience that they could do because it's really boring topic talking to the same person for like five hours and yeah most of the girls that go there they have no personality and so it's like you almost want to drink more um just so that you can get through it. yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, i guess that's an interest this is something i want to ask you um what is one thing that you if you have to talk to somebody for five hours especially with somebody who has zero personality how do you maintain that does it like certain tricks you have to learn or did you have to just figure it out by like trial by fire as you said earlier yeah i mean i mean so there's karaoke right um yeah okay if you if you're gonna I'm karaoke sure please like he didn't pronounce <laughs> karaoke correctly like, yeah he, he, i bet he doesn't speak japanese he, he said karaoke like a yeah like just a say Japanese. okinawa next <laughs> yeah so like we have like there's tvs everywhere in the clubs and and so like you'll often like sing and sing songs do like games with the songs like if, i'm not sure if you've seen the medley games that they have where it's like a bunch of anime songs or a bunch of songs in 1995 or whatever it is um stuff like that for example card games you know the there's also like the barrel poking game where you stick swords in it's oh like, really like a ton of that junk <laughs> just, just, okay because... wait 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 so it's just like izakaya shit basically <laughs> it's izakaya shit yeah okay all right but with somebody who's a bit more attractive looking yeah basically the the idea is i mean it's it's really not about looks um it's really about just entertaining people, right? And oh, right. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's just that makes like sense. Keeping the conversation going. So one of the things I would do is I would keep up with Japanese news, like celebrity news and TV shows, and like I, I don't like that stuff. I think it's so <laughs> banal. Right. You had to it's read like, like all the tabloid magazines and everything, like Spa and Friday and yeah. all those. Oh, at least with Friday, you have a great centerfold, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, but, that's the payoff, um, right? Sure. Well, I think they're phasing those out, though. Or they're, like, they're, now they just have faces of women. They don't have them, like, you know, they have cleavage or anything anymore. Oh, okay. That's too bad. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, there's nothing else redeeming in those magazines. Right? Yeah, right? So, yeah. But it gives um, you topics. Like, you would talk about Arashi's tour or some dumb stuff like that. And so... So yeah, that's oh, that is that's what you have to do to keep the conversation going. You have to like also the blood types. You have to know that really well because that's big here. And so right. you create, you grab these topics, you train yourself on these topics like blood type, and you then you take that topic and you engage with them and you try to just spin it a number of ways to like blow an hour. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, okay. So you eventually want to translate all of this this whole experience of your life into some kind of a book um what what does this book gonna even look like because i'm trying to like picture what this book would look like and we were talking before we did this interview we were talking a lot about tokyo vice by jake edelstein who you're not really a much of a fan of uh and guessing it wouldn't look anything like that yeah i mean so that's that's the trick is because it it's been a while um like clearly i have photos that prove that i've done it right um and I, I probably like know most about more about the these clubs than i think most people um in terms of detail and how it works training cleaning the toilets when you start out shit like that so um so yeah i guess you know one of the things i why, why i didn't do the youtube thing was i, I just didn't want to be a vlogger or a J vlogger. yeah um, i don't blame you and also yeah not like i just don't want to be so focused on japan because i just don't want it to define me and i just i think there's a lot of interesting topics to talk about um so so basically what i what i thought for the book was um 
you know, I can kind of retell the experience. There's this great co-writer. She's, I mean, she's a best-selling author for a reason and Netflix has picked up her stuff. I want to kind of uh, recreate the experience in a narrative form um, yeah. as best as I can. But also I want to interject uh, reflective kind of lessons and, and, and take an experience and talk about why I learned about it or how I still think about it 15 years later, for example, um, and just kind of just write a newsletter about that. Um, I'm not sure if anyone knows who James Clear is. Yeah, he wrote a book called Atomic Habits and he'll share an experience and kind of like what he's learned from it or someone else's experience and what what they derived from it. And right. um, so, yeah, I think that would be fun. Um, and it's just kind of a way to retain my memory of, of events and, and kind of remember how it shaped me. Right. If I can share that with people and they enjoy it, then that's fun. The, the, you've met, we mentioned uh, prior to this interview also that <laughs> it's starting to sound like the, the, inter the interview before the interview is more interesting than this interview. Not to cannibalize this interview, but um, we were talking about how uh, you know a lot more, or you feel like you, you have a better understanding of the underworld of Japan than uh, our friend Mr. Jake Edelstein does. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Oh, right. That was uh, like the, the concept video where we talk about what he knows is <laughs> the, the, the spicy video yeah. content. Talk. Yeah, I mean, it was just, I know, I know. Well, the crazy thing is, so I, I helped build a commenting system for a major Japanese news company, one of the top three. In Japan. Oh, really? And I met a lot of the editors, like editors in chief, people who had been working in the business for like 30, 40 years. And no one knew him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no one knew him. And these are people that he interacted with in his book. So, um, oh, wow. So yeah, so, okay. I did not, I did not know that. Okay. All right. But not like at that specific newspaper, but like I'm talking about the topics that he reported on. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that, that was weird. I thought, um, but then there's the other element is just like the way the Yakuza is portrayed and all that stuff. Um, it's like, it's like this organization, almost like the Illuminati in his book, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, you, you how is it that. like the Illuminati? Or I'd have to reread it. I can't remember exactly how he portrayed them. All I remember is they wanted to kill him, quote unquote, or at least that's what he says in the book. I don't know if he wanted. He wrote that in to sound cool or what, but I don't know. Like again, it was just it was just really cheesy from my stance. I mean, not to say that they don't do bad stuff. They do. It's just, right. I, right. I think, I think the portrayal was really cheesy. Um, but like, you know, I think there's a lot of elements that he didn't touch on, which is just how, so, so night world focused front and center Yakuza, right? And clearly mm -hmm. they have their hands and stuff and they're bad people. Um, but one of the things that they don't focus on is just the regurgitation and like the community of people in the night world that aren't Yakuza, right? Right. And, you know, it's, it's like, so for when people are hosts, what do they do after? Well, they become bookkeepers at other host clubs or hostess clubs or mm -hmm. Fuzo shops, right? That, that's the reality of hosts that don't make enough money. They become bookkeepers at the front door <laughs> or huh. they, if they did make enough money, they open a bar in Kabukicho and then, and then people in the biz know them and they get taken there because they know the deal and they can play along when people bring in a customer. Right. Or they open up a, a ramen shop or they do something like that. But yeah. Largely, they don't leave the, the world. Um, and then like the, the kids that do it as a student and they're going to college and they're just trying to make money, they get out and they like they disappear. Um, they're, they're the good cases. Um, but the people who are uneducated and they come from the countryside to make it in the big city, kind of like every cliche story. I mean, they get recycled back into this underworld and um, and they're not working for the Yakuza, right? They're just like, they just happen to be part of this world because they didn't follow the linear path in Japanese culture, right? Right. So, so yeah, that was just the weird thing about it. It was, it was like, it was not, that whole underworld was nothing but them. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the reality of Kabukicho or any other area. All right, then, uh, John, I think that about wraps it up. That was quite the, uh, that's quite the life story. I learned a lot. Um, more things about Mormonism than I, I can care to remember, or maybe I, I don't remember. 
Um, you brought a lot of it back for me, man. Like, I'm going to have to, like, crack open the Book of Mormon to, to get my fill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't remember half of that stuff. <laughs> All right, sure. then. Uh, that, that about wraps it up. Anything you want to say before we go? Um, yeah, if you're interested in, in reading text, um, I, I just don't have time to make videos, really. Um, definitely go to bookofhost.com. Um, I think it's linked in many places. But yeah, yeah I'll link it in the description com. below. Or if you just Google Book of Host and front and center newsletter, sign up. And tomorrow, if you do, I'll share my, my Mormon name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is what everybody came here for. All right, so uh, next week, not next week, tomorrow on the show is uh, Kevin Crocker, the man with the incredible voice. He does voice acting on Fiverr, and I'm not sure if he does it 100% f- professionally. We'll talk to him tomorrow. Um, he works here in Japan. Um, so until then, I'm Radri, and... I'm John. And, uh, hey, John. Yeah. Jesus, man.